And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Hello again. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you are a return listener or a first time listener, we appreciate your listenership and hope that these conversations are helpful for you as you think about preparing students for the modern world. A quick reminder that we are offering a free six week series of one pagers that are related to teachers and leaders. There are two different tracks called Teach Thoughts and Lead Thoughts that you can sign up for if you go to wegrowteachers.com forward slash thoughts. We are, as of this podcast publishing, already underway, but if you sign up, you will get caught up with links to the previous weeks of content. And again, you can find that at wegrowteachers.com forward slash thoughts. And of course, if you are looking for professional development for your school or your organization, please feel free to reach out to me at drew at teachthought.com. Our website is, of course, wegrowteachers.com. And there you can find the ways in which we tend to work with schools and organizations to better prepare their students for the modern world. In this episode, I spoke with Michelle Brown, who is the founder and CEO of CommonLit, which you can find at commonlit.org. And our conversation started by telling her story and why she founded it and some of the nuts and bolts of commonlit.org. From there, we spent most of our time talking about the ways in which she thinks about best practices for teaching and learning about literacy. And some of those things centered on the inclusion of knowledge and the importance of knowledge-rich teaching and learning and contextualizing the work and readings that students might do and how that affects their growth and achievement and engagement and many of the pieces around that. We touched on the reading levels myth and she talked a lot about coherence and engagement and joy of reading. And we also talked a bit about project-based learning and the ways in which that may or may not fit really well with the ways that she thinks about teaching and learning around ELA. So if you are a teacher who is looking to improve your practice in teaching and learning of literacy, I think this is an important conversation and raises some important questions, especially about the use of sort of isolated and decontextualized passages and readings as students engage in them to find main idea or very discrete skills, because it does really call that practice into question, and I think that's worth looking a bit more into. So I hope it's helpful. All right, I am here with Michelle Brown via Zoom as usual, and we're going to talk about her work, which is as the founder uh, the founder of CommonLit, which um, will be the basis of our conversation, but best practices in literacy and reading. But as I usually like to do, Michelle, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give our listeners a little bit of background on, I guess, your, your, uh, your story coming up to this point. Yeah, Drew, thank you so much for having me. Um, So I'm Michelle Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of CommonLit. Um, So we are a nonprofit education technology organization that is best known for operating commonlit.org, which it's pretty crazy. I'll, I'll share the whole story of how we got to this point, but that has grown really quickly in just a few years to serve over 20 million teachers and students nationally. And so commonlit.org has essentially become sort of like a go-to free resource, uh, particularly for English teachers and also a growing number of social studies teachers who are looking for high quality digital texts. Um, And so we have a library of over 2,000 short stories, news articles, poems, excerpts of classic literature, uh, longer works, novellas, and it's all super searchable, organized, completely free for teachers and students. 
And um, available, all of those passages have questions and you can annotate the text. You can assign them through the platform. It's really quite interactive. Um, and so it's really just become like a go-to sort of core infrastructure for, for learning nationally. And particularly, you could probably imagine how in a pandemic environment, mm -hmm. how what a big value proposition we have. Right. So you, you, you founded this, came up with this idea after being a teacher for a number of years, and maybe you can speak a little bit about your, your teaching experience. But then also, I guess how, I mean, every entrepreneur, or at least most of them that I'm aware of, uh, finds a problem and tries to solve that problem. So I suppose I'm, I'm curious what that problem was or what, what, what was the spark for starting and, and developing Common Lit? Yeah, so, so my background is, so I grew up in South Texas. Um, I went to public schools. My mom is actually um, Cuban, and so I grew up speaking English and Spanish in the home. Um, I went to Butler University, um, actually on a classical ballet scholarship. Interestingly, I had no intention of going into education or becoming a teacher at all. Um, but I decided that show business wasn't for me after <laughs> just a few weeks of my undergrad um, and switched my major to be an English and Spanish double major um, and just like really sort of immerse myself in academics in a way that I sort of really hadn't before. I was always a voracious reader and loved reading, um, always just like for pleasure. Um, and so long story short, I, um, you know, I graduated uh, from college in 2009 and joined Teach for America um, that year. So I went to a, um, I taught, I was placed in a school in rural Mississippi in a high poverty school there teaching seventh grade English language arts. And, you know, I could say a lot about my experience, but, you know, one thing that stands out to me is just and I don't think that um, people who haven't been in the classroom like ex just like appreciate this, but the thing that stood out to me was the sheer number of hours that I spent searching online for materials to use in my classroom and instructional planning. I mean, that was really my reality for like every single minute of free time that I had. And I felt like I was scrambling. And the thing that was, you know, you ask about the problem that I ran into, it was essentially that what I found online was just not worthy of my students' time or attention. What I found was stupid. It was like <laughs> dumb activities that were disconnected, dinky little stories and passages and sort of like filler activities that you could really string together. And so, you know, what I noticed is that, you know, what that looked like for me as a novice teacher in a classroom, is uh, a novice reading teacher in a classroom, is that the experience for my students was really disconnected and really incoherent. So what did that look like? It was like, on Monday, we might read something about, you know, ant colonies. A short passage and then find the main idea on tuesday we might read something about jackie robinson find the main idea on wednesday we, we might read something about the supreme court find the main idea and so you can see how you know and now because i've like gotten a degree and, you know, have focused on, um, you know, best practices in adolescent literacy instruction and have really come to understand how children develop their, um, how they build language and how they build knowledge, um, particularly in the middle grades. And what I've come to understand is just how um, an antithetical to research that approach is, that skills, you know, focused approach in those grades. Um, and so, you know, long story short, so I, I um, 
met my husband um, in Mississippi. Uh, we both moved to Boston where I continued teaching, um, also middle school reading. But I was handed a curriculum on day one um, at my new school that had been perfected by veteran teachers over the course of like 14 years. And it was filled with wonderful children's liter literature and coherent instructional units all framed with an inquiry question, you know, like an enduring understanding, like mm -hmm. how does power corrupt? And, you know, all of the stories sort of spoke to that idea. Um, and it was just transformative having that curriculum that I could rely on with everything built out was transformative for my practice and also for my students learning. Um, so that's when I really like thought, wow, there's really something here. And I just thought like, what a shame that, you know, we don't have this online <laughs> for free for everyone to access. Like, um, so, and it kind of made me mad. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, frankly, that just like, why is this not on the internet? Why haven't we done this? So what I envisioned was just, a world where there is a place where teachers could go that was as simple and as you know clear to navigate as like shopping at your favorite online boutique. <laughs> mm. That was my idea, where the stories were organized and tagged, um, all free um, and all sort of coherently organized, so that you could do instructional planning. Um, so that, that was the idea for Common Lit. Um, and then, you know, I started it when I was in graduate school, getting my master's degree in education policy. Um, and it was essentially my master's thesis. Um, so I ran an experiment with 222 students um, in Boston public schools. And, um, you know, half of the students had access to a very, very early version of Common Lit, which was just on Google Drive. <laughs> and um, the other half just continued with whatever they had. And what I was interested in, um, in the comparison group and in the treatment group, are the, were the changes in student engagement and in their motivation for reading and in their joy for mm. reading. So that was essentially was what I was measuring. And, um, you know, commonly it also has like a shared classroom approach and a really like discussion based approach. So it's very based on um, inclusive, uh, like maximum inclusion for students who are behind in reading or labeled as behind in reading. And so it's not a skills driven approach. It's not like where, you know, you have one corner where a child is like working on one thing in another corner. <laughs> another child is working on something else, you know, in the name of differentiation. It's really not that. It's like more about um, shared reading and really getting students um, deeper into subjects um, and like gaining a sense of expertise with an inquiry question. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the cool thing um, today is that, you know, since that master's thesis that I wrote and since that experiment, um, you know, I, I won a small research grant, like $5,000 from, from Harvard. Um, and then I also had a little bit of wedding money. And so when I graduated, you um, said wedding money, wedding money. Yeah. So <laughs> I was a newlywed. That's funny. And actually, my husband was clerking, um, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is where his family was from. And I stayed at home in our little apartment um, and took all the money that we had gotten from our wedding like, <laughs> checks. It was like, I don't know, maybe $2,000. And I used it to pay a uh, web developer overseas in India mm -hmm. <laughs> who helped me build version 1.0 of Common Lit. And so all it had was, you know, a website, a web domain, and then a little spot where I could, it was, there were two buttons. It was upload and publish. I could upload a lesson to the site and publish it, but I couldn't unpublish it. <laughs> so it had to be really good. So, you know, I just wrote lessons from my kitchen table. Um, and then 
11 months later, we had 1 million registered users. So hmm. it grew so fast, um, which is actually strangely uh, about as fast as Facebook got its 1 millionth registered user, I recently found out. So really, really fast. And um, now we have 40 employees. We're based in Washington, D.C. and um, you know, a full engineering team and the website itself has grown. So it's, you know, the library of the passages, but also we have comprehensive full curriculum too, mm. which is um, something that we had been working on for the past three years. Well, that is a fascinating story. And that means, of course, you're the Mark Zuckerberg of literacy. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> One question before we get into some of the substantive pieces of literacy. So you, you, you mentioned it's free. And so I guess one of the, the questions that, that comes to mind is how is it free and, and who's paying for these 40 employees and engineers and, and impressive machinery that you've got? Yeah, so since Commonlet started, um, I've become really good at fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've actually raised a little over $20 million in philanthropic funding for Common Lit. Um, and we also have, you know, some wraparound services that is a growing source of recurring earned revenue because, you know, one thing I've learned as a founder of a nonprofit, especially as a tech company, is one is that you have to feed the fire. <laughs> tech <laughs> companies are really expensive. Mm. And, you know, especially with like rising developer or engineering salaries, which is just like, you know, skyrocketing because of big tech. Um, you know, it's something I've really had to keep up with. And, um, but philanthropy has really come through for us. Um, we also got um, some government uh, funding through the Department of Education through a program called Innovative Approaches to Literacy. Um, so, you know, through the government funding and philanthropic funding, we've really been able to grow. Okay. So you mentioned a few things that uh, piqued my interest and, and, you know, some of the things, especially as you're talking about, you know, like these sort of isolated you know stories or i think you used the word i haven't heard in a long time but i like it dinky <laughs> yeah, yep. these these sort of you know we're going to read about this and main idea read about this main idea which is I, I think as you put it or as i would put it skills focused and it seems consistent with like i've talked with natalie wexler uh, a couple times for the podcast and, and i think she really makes that point that knowledge is a really vital missing piece in lots of the literary, literacy instruction. And so I suppose it's a lot about context. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I think about teaching and learning and differentiated instruction, at least in some way, especially in the context of literacy, about being very context dependent and and I think Natalie's very right in uh, the idea that without significant knowledge or background knowledge that it can be very difficult if not just sort of you know not very interesting for kids to be reading and finding the main idea unless of course that topic happens to resonate with that kid so, you know, like I maybe unpack how you think about that sort of context and knowledge piece of the literacy, especially as it relates to reading levels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just one thing I'll say before I get into all that is kind of the why and why I'm so obsessed with this idea of coherence. Um, I mean, we so common lit our mission and, you know, my life's work is to close persistent opportunity gaps in literacy. Um, you know, I think just big picture, uh, I just wanna remind listeners, like this is a crisis. This is a crisis before the pandemic, it's a crisis now. I think it's just something that we've like come to, I don't know, accept because it's been so hard to move the needle. Um, but, you know, I mean, just a reminder that only 20% of low-income students today read on grade level. And that to me is just like at scale, we're doing an incredibly poor 
job of delivering on the promise of public education if those are the results. Um, and, you know, it, I don't have to remind you, but, you know, students who graduate from high school unable to read and write at high levels are just have a really tough time in our economy competing. And, you know, so if I had, you know, in all my years um, of being in the classroom and then studying adolescent literacy and really understanding, like, if there's one thing I would bet on, it would be to bring coherence to reading instruction. And what do I mean by that? Um, I think Natalie Wexler like paints a really important picture and I love the way in the beginning chapters of her book where she just takes us to a into a classroom to actually hear what it's like um, to be in a classroom that doesn't have coherence where you know where students are learning something that's not connected you know topically or you know thematically to something that they're they learned about the day before um so you know, I think here's what we know about reading instruction or the way that students become better readers and writers and thinkers. Speaking, speaking and listening, reading and writing are all connected. They're inextricably linked. And that that is key. And in terms of, you know, reading and writing and speaking, success begets success. So the better you get at one thing, it's like it builds your momentum. And it built, so what should that look like in the classroom? It's actually observable. You could track it. You can track the number of minutes that students spend actually reading, actually writing, like sustained writing, and actually speaking in class. Um, and there is a body of research too, um, and I think their TNTP also put out um, a report, I think a few years ago, maybe in 2018, called the Opportunity Myth that actually looked at this and found that, you know, at scale, a lot of students just don't get enough road miles or enough practice actually speaking, actually writing, actually doing um, like grade level work. And these dinky activities and these filler <laughs> activities uh, that you we just talked about, um, sadly, are like the norm in many, many classrooms. And I, I just have a lot of empathy for teachers. And I have a lot of empathy for particularly for novice teachers. And what I've come to understand is just how tough it is to plan like an instructional unit, five to seven weeks of instruction that you know, gets into a topic that, you know, is surprising for students that, you know, where they can just like, where all of the activities fit together and that have a nice, you know, bow at the end of it. It's just really hard to do that. Um, so that that's why I think common lit is so important is, you know, we've sort of, it's a baseline for teachers that we have the instructional units, we have um, you know, reading passages that are grouped thematically. So if you go to Common Lit, you can find um, reading passages that are grouped by themes like power or growing up or, um, you know, different topics too. Yeah, so I'm reminded of years ago, and I've, I've tried to find this video and unsuccessfully, it was a video of as I remember it, uh, a man talking to a crowd of, I would guess, teachers. And again, it was very, very long ago, but it, he was making the point, or or one of his main points was that the, uh, about the importance of how, uh, like how interested and engaged kids are in the material which relates to you know some of the things that you talked about with your thesis and and i'm curious as a side note how you measured engagement and joy and, and those kinds of things because that's that's a difficult thing to quantify of course but that that i guess dynamic or lack of dynamic 
is really important and has to his to his uh, thinking or what he was saying is that kids will and i suppose adults would too really be able to to tackle more difficult texts above what one might say is the reading level if and when they are really engaged and or motivated by whatever that is about that is you know if they are really let's say trying i think he was putting in the context of like technical manuals and so somebody who's really engaged in trying to figure out how to work on a car or i I don't remember exactly what what it was if if that's what they are really motivated to do and that that text is difficult for them they would much more be much more likely to be able to decode that and and work harder i suppose to do that in ways that would yield results versus saying okay read this piece which you don't maybe care about and don't have any real interest in and that 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 dynamic was really powerful and i've been able to try i've not, i've been unable to find that video and I, again i don't know I'm curious how you think about it. I don't know if that's research-based, but I have always wondered about that because intuitively it makes sense to me. Yeah, so let me put it this way. So I had a um, a professor, my favorite professor, and I think he's right, um, that basically said that intelligence, is, here's how he defined intelligence, is the ability to pay prolonged attention to the subcomponent parts of a complex structure. And I think that's really right in whatever field you're going into. Um, I, I think that's really true. And so the question is, so how do you how do we get students to actually become engaged or motivated to pay longer and longer, you know, uh prolonged attention to more and more complex structures whether it's a word problem or um you know a project or a difficult text or a difficult manual Mm -hmm. and you know teachers talk about engagement a lot and i and you know they often say that that's the problem they diagnose like oh well my kids aren't engaged or they aren't motivated Mm -hmm. but In my research and what I've come to find and understand and believe is that engagement and knowledge are linked. You're not going to get, it's kind of the same thing. You're not going to become more engaged in a technical manual. I mean, I guess you could present the technical manual with flashing colors and do a tap (laughs) dance and everything. And you might get a little more like kind of short, um, you know, uh, you might trick students to right. pay attention to it or something. Some but extrinsic you're not motivators. Get, exactly. But you're not going to get them intrinsically motivated to ask and answer their own questions or to really start to do more sophisticated like research and the things and like independent research and the things that we really want our kids to be able to do. Um, they have to know stuff. They have to know stuff about the topic and they have to become and like once they know stuff, um, they become it's like that thing that I was talking about momentum success begets more begets more success. They have the language to talk about that subject. And so it builds their confidence. And when it builds their confidence, it builds their like social capital. When it builds their social capital, they become, you know, experts and um, and then, you know, when they're able to uh, solve a problem, you know, it's just they can tackle more and more complicated things. So, you know, I think that Natalie Wexler, you know, and this idea of knowledge, um, I think she's really on to something. Um, and so, you know, coming back to reading instruction, I just think we need to not think about reading and writing instruction, particularly in the middle grades as this like discrete or like a set of discrete skills, you know, um, that we can like remediate. Mm -hmm. It's about subject knowledge and depth of knowledge. 
Yeah, so it strikes me, and this is one of the things that I talked with Natalie about in at least one or probably, I think I think she's been on the podcast twice. They, you know, We're advocates, and I advocate strongly for project-based learning and inquiry learning, which you've mentioned inquiry and you know, sort of the, the driven, uh, being some of the instruction being driven by questions and students asking and answering their questions, which I'm a, a big proponent of. And I, I, I think that it's very true, and I talk about this with teachers in our workshops and in other places as well, but like the sort of mindset of, or the criticism of progressive constructivist education is that in many cases it's sort of lacking in knowledge rich uh, you know, content or something like that. And in many ways is after behavioral engagement more than cognitive engagement and that teachers don't often think about that distinction. I don't know if you make other distinctions with your work in, in how you define engagement. And so I, I say, you know, we have to be really thoughtful about inclusion of, especially in any, you know, sort of academic setting that, that has content standards that are, that are real and, and, you know, being held accountable for outside of like genius hour or, or 20% time or something like that, passion projects that we have to be really uh, intentional in our design and that that process means that we know that the cognitive path that we want them to go on, which is knowledge rich and and really full of, of lots of academic content, uh, we have to be intentional in that design. But one of the things that that people push back on, they say, well, you know, students can't ask great questions about things they don't know anything about, which I do, I, I think that that is largely true. It's very hard to, to ask what would I would say great questions. Certainly we can ask questions and then that process begets more questions and then you dive in and you, you get a little bit more depth and you get more rich questions or beautiful questions or however you want to characterize those things. So what we talk about is let's not front load those things as knowledge, which is how I would characterize it or I do characterize it with teachers is let's pre pre front load whatever you want to uh, call that you know the, the the bottom pieces of bloom's taxonomy that knowledge and and remember and understand pieces and then we ask them to go do something with it whether it's a project or some version of that we ask them to start at the top with students of create asking them to create something and then facilitate and pull out those things that are at the bottom remember and understand and go through the project and and really analyze and do the critical thinking with it and so so therein lies to me in that process where literacy can really flourish because, and, and this makes the assumption that the students are engaged or, or find the project or the work of that project interesting, meaningful, relevant, engaging, uh, that then they use, because they are working on something that they find useful and authentic and meaningful, that the, that the texts that they might engage with are are more interesting and therefore that context becomes really important it kind of gets to some of the things that we were talking about before of being able to to sort of level up or push push up into more difficult text because i really want to figure this out and this is the resource mm -hmm. that will help me figure that out so i don't know if that any of that makes sense or where you might push back on that yeah so i'm gonna i hung on one thing that you said that mm -hmm. I think it, I just want to draw out more and it speaks to, so you asked me about like, how did I measure mm -hmm. student engagement or joy in reading? Yeah. And, um, one of the things that, um, it, it was through a student survey and I can talk more about that. Um, but you know, one thing that we found through that study and that I think has been consistently proven is that when you set up, authentic purpose mm -hmm. for students to read um, motivation increases and they're more likely to have like a coherent experience and to you know derive meaning from that thing when it's an authentic purpose mm -hmm. and the the authentic purpose isn't you know 
find out the point of view of the speaker. <laughs> like <laughs> that's not, you know, you don't pick up a newspaper and go like, oh, I want, really want to know the main idea or the, right, right. you know, the point of view or, gee, I wonder how tone is developed in paragraph two. Right, right. You know, I mean, like, oh man, what a way to kill joy. Like that's not an authentic purpose. Right. So the ways that, you know, that is a skill. That's the way you find meaning. <laughs> That's not an authentic purpose. Right. An authentic purpose for reading might be something like, um, you know, discover what it's connected to content and like the content of the thing. It's like find out more oh, why, you know, ocean trash is like such a problem mm -hmm. for, you know, our, our global health or something like that. Mm -hmm. That, oh, now that's interesting. Right. And I use a skill like finding the main idea in order to find the meaning. But what I'm really doing is finding the deeper meaning. And so you asked about project-based learning. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, you know, project-based learning is like even that higher application purpose. So you could have, I think that good project-based learning is very literacy focused mm -hmm. and has a lot of reading in it. Um, and hopefully it's reading, like I mentioned, with an authentic purpose, but mm -hmm. with with a pro culminating project um, where students like show off their skills or apply or create something new with that new knowledge, now you've just given the purpose for reading an even greater purpose mm -hmm. and even more momentum and joy for the student because they can, you know, um, create a video or convince somebody or write a letter for someone that, you know, to your legislator, something for an authentic purpose mm -hmm. um, where, you know, that's not just like, your teacher is going to read your report right, right. <laughs> where you talked about how tone is developed in paragraph two, like, Oh, geez, we got it. Mm -hmm. We got to stop doing that. Right. Yeah. So the, the purpose, and we talk about this in our workshops because purpose and authenticity for us are really closely linked. And we, when we have teachers craft a driving question, we really emphasize, let's be clear in your planning and also be clear with your students so that your students are clear about this is product purpose and audience and the purpose piece here so you know what are we creating why are we creating it and for whom and the purpose there sometimes teachers get confused and they say well the purpose is to so that they learn this stuff and and to to, to come back to how you phrased it you know like the purpose is so that they understand tone or main idea Yes, that is the purpose or a purpose for teachers to have them engage in this activity. And those things are important, right? It is important when we read the New York Times or, or whatever you say, where, what's the main idea here and what's the tone or what are the, you know, the points of view and all those things that you might use or build as skills and literacy practices. But the purpose for the work is for the audience. Like how is this serving the needs of the audience mm -hmm. in the most authentic project-based learning settings? So it is, I think, really important to make that distinction. And, and teachers, it, it strikes me as, as an odd question because it, it, it underscores or highlights how how teachers often think about teaching and learning that it's in service of building the skills which is important mm -hmm. but there's that lack of authenticity so I, I, I don't even have a question there it just it just strikes me yeah. as how important that that level of authenticity is and the clarity around purpose yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that I've noticed, and it sounds like you've noticed it too, is that a lot of classrooms just don't get to that level of instructional planning where, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you're applying what you learned or the knowledge that you gained. And mm -hmm. I think that might be why we're seeing, particularly in English classes, <laughs> you know, a lot of students saying, you know, this is not relevant. This mm -hmm. is I'm not, this is not connecting. I don't understand why I'm here. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it strikes me too. I mean, I've said this uh, for a number of years, like the, the way that standardized testing tends to be uh, designed is 
you know, you're like, read this passage and then find the main idea and those kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> and so you say, well, why are students not doing well? And it, it may be that they lack that skill, but it's also, again, non-contextualized very often, right? I mean, it's a standardized mm -hmm. test, so who knows what the students may have as prior knowledge. And, the, you know, read this passage, which, again, is decontextualized. And it, it seems to me that there's some some uh, some sort of st statistical invalidity or something there that might surface if you do that. If you were to, and, and it's impossible to do with the standardized test across the country or across states, but like that seems to me to be a real problem. And I don't know if you if you've you know kind of thought more about the way that we you know like my daughters take map testing, and I imagine they're in that same kind of, of boat. So to to the extent that you have any thoughts on on standardized testing and the ways that that it sort of reveals our literacy. Uh, efficacy with students I'm, I'm curious yeah so I mean I think you're touching on something which is that the standards and the accountability structures have like so much of a trickle up or trickle down I don't know which direction <laughs> effect on what how teachers teach mm -hmm, how mm -hmm. they plan instructionally um, and how they think about their, you know, instructional domain. And certainly in literacy, this is absolutely the case is that, you know, we've been very, you know, uh, focused on standardized tests. And I think, you know, I have an education policy degree. So this is the way that we know that we have a uh, persistent achievement gap and that mm -hmm. we're not serving students. So it has a standardized testing has a really important sort of macro level policy um, policy um, uh, point to it. But when it comes to what teachers are teaching every day in the classroom and the kind of experiences that they're crafting for students to move through, that was not the intention of standardized tests. And I would be really interested, maybe, Drew, you could have someone from <laughs> a creator of a standardized test on your podcast to mm -hmm. ask them these questions, because I would be curious to know whether or not when they look at their data, and I'm speaking about English language arts, mm -hmm. math is, a diff is different, and the way we learn math is different. But for English language arts, I'd be curious to know if a student gets one like type of question correct like a quote unquote main idea question or a quote unquote point of view question does that predict that they will get the second and third question tagged that way correct because i don't think that those those structures that we've created of the skills and standards they're created we created them they're not based in like cognitive science or there, there are nothing about those standards and skills that are, you know, inherent in human beings or like the way that we think or learn language or anything like that. So, you know, I would imagine that the data around skills um, is very, very noisy mm -hmm. and um, may not be the best way for us to proceed. This has you know, when we're talking about closing achievement gaps or differentiation, differentiation, uh, differentiating instruction, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm just, I'm skeptical um, that this approach of kind of, okay, use it over here and work on main idea, use it over here and work on point of view, use it over here and work on whatever. I don't think there's any research um, backing that shows that that works. So just to clarify, you said, so item one, item two, item three, the way that you're using that is that it would be with the, the next item within that same reading passage or the same skill with a different reading passage? Um, both. I don't think that, yeah, because I think that language and you know, items and constructs are, you know, you can't decontextualize them from like the content of the passage. Mm -hmm. So then if, if we don't want 
them sitting and working on discrete skills individually, as you described it, what what do we want that to look like? Yeah, so I think this is an important question to ask, particularly as we're coming back from a pandemic. And, you know, after a year of, you know, what some people are calling learning loss, and I'm not sure that's the best way to describe what happened to kids, but, but nevertheless, um, and no, I, I worry about coming back and having students, my nightmare scenario would be that we bring them back and we socially isolate them more in working on different, you know, in yeah. corners of rooms, working on different skills um, for the goal of quote unquote, you know, remediating or differentiating instruction. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, they're working on just like I said, these dinky passages and kind of moving through content. Um, you know, I that's not how kids learn language. Instead, I'd much rather see a more inclusive um, shared classroom experience with shared reading and with an authentic purpose, like I mentioned before, and sort of a more like project focused, um, like culminating purpose at the end of it all. Uh, it, it strikes me as, as a little bit concerning. I've seen some language from, I suppose, districts or, or something like that, where they've said, we're going to really focus on and we're going to do accelerated learning, which I'm thinking, okay, because of the pandemic, you know, and this, this, mm-hmm. this sort of idea of learning loss, which, you know, as you said, is, is how we want to talk about that is, is a subject for another debate or, or discussion. But like, so if you say now we're going to do this accelerated learning to catch kids up, what were you doing before? And why or how was this different and or better if it's, is it only in service? Uh, uh, what are they catching up on? Is it skills? Is it content? Is it both? And of course, like I said, like, what were you doing before? Like, I'm not sure, w- were we decelerating learning? Or were we right. just sort of <laughs> marking time, going the regular pace? I, I, it seems, strikes me as, as really bizarre. To, to, to phrase it that way, but perhaps I'm missing something. Uh, one of the things that we talked about before we started recording was the the work of Timothy Shanahan, who I am mostly unfamiliar with other than his Twitter posts and some of the, the sort of debates or, and some of them pretty seem to be kind of high conflict around the way that teaching of, of literacy happens in our in our schools. And so as we were talking before we went live, like I, I'm, I don't know enough about it and I feel like I should know more about it, even to the extent of maybe having him or and or his critics on or a critic of, of his on. But I'm curious because I know you have, have a better knowledge of that. So what does that what is that debate uh, really about? Well, you know, one thing I'll mention is that Timothy Shanahan, you should absolutely have him on the podcast. He is also incredibly accessible and he's sort of become like my go-to mm-hmm. <laughs> researcher when I have a question and mm-hmm. he like usually responds to me directly within like just a few minutes. And um, he's just like, you know, very active on Twitter. He also has a wonderful blog where he writes in this like non-jargony, very accessible way that I love <laughs> about his work. Um, but so I um, came across Timothy Shanahan because of his work uh, around like his thinking about disciplinary literacy. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, like where when you're in a history class um, or when you're in like a government class versus when you're in an English language arts class, the way you are approaching text and talking about text and thinking about text should be different. Same for science, the way you're, you know, so it's the idea that you're thinking like a historian when you approach a, you know, a historical text Mm -hmm. or like a primary source document. Um, And it's like a frame of mind. You're, you know, for a primary source document, it's like, well, what was going on at the time? Who's writing this? In what context? Where are they based? What happened before? Um, 
you know, what pressures were they facing, you know, and like, um, where was this published? And what's the story that's not being told? And there are just all of these important, like, frames of thinking. Um, and then when you're in that classroom versus when you're in a science classroom, for example, mm-hmm. you can think of other like important frames of mind. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was just so inspiring to me when I was starting Common Lit. Um, you know, I was reading Timothy Shanahan. Um, and the reason was, you know, on Common Lit, we have science texts, we have historical documents, we have news articles. And um, every reading passages is framed with um, like a question for students. It's like, as you read, think about something. And so, um, so that's really what what I was interested in. Lately, I've been talking to Timothy Shanahan and focused on this idea of the myth of reading levels, Mm -hmm. which is really fascinating. And so I recommend that, you know, if you're, if you want to start, um, go to his blog and check out, you know, some of his writing about, about that. Um, and especially his writing about the origins of reading levels, um, which, you know, I've sort of concluded has a really like shaky, <laughs> shaky <laughs> research uh, base. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it, again, it, it really does strike me as, as interesting because I don't know Timothy other than what I've seen on, on Twitter and some of the back and forth, but what I perceive is, and, and Natalie and I talked about this, Natalie Wexler and I talked about this, and several of the people who would, you know, I think, be very sympathetic or sort of travel in the same sort of academic theory circles in the way that we think about teaching and learning with Natalie, and, and I would maybe assume, or I would perceive that that Timothy would probably be in that that boat as well, would be very highly critical of sort of constructivist inquiry, uh, project-based learning kinds of approaches. But I find so much common ground when we talk about the way that we think about project-based learning. And again, that sort of authenticity, which is really contextualizing. And we talk about uh, one of the things that I, that I ask teachers to think about is like we – think about content mastery as an outcome of our courses and and classes that we teach in k-12 especially is is like that's the accountability incentive structure right it's like we want all of the kids ideally to leave our classes and courses with a content mastery of whatever we are teaching and i i think that's a fine ideal and certainly something to keep in mind, but it's totally unrealistic. I mean, I have taught, I taught for 15 years and I say, you know, I, I had one student, actually two students who I felt came somewhat close to that in any given class and they were brilliant, but I think a better or or perhaps more useful way to think about the way that we, we think about content mastery is kind of like you said, like we want them to think learn how to think and act like whatever it is that they are engaging in. Think like a historian, think like a scientist, think like a mathematician, which means that you have to have significant content understanding and know the questions that are important to be asking as a historian and even some of the processes and frameworks that might be unique to a historian or a mathematician or, you know, a, a, a an, an artist or, you know, you could go down the long list of whatever that context is. And so that's that to me is, is a really important shift or question. And we can certainly keep both things in mind, but it does strike me as, as curious that the many of the people who I... T- think are very critical or push back vocally, and I I don't want to mischaracterize Timothy's view of project-based learning, but Natalie and I talked about this, that they they don't think it is, is yielding the results that we want. And when we talk, it it's like, I mean, I talked with a, a professor from Moorhead State University in Kentucky here, classical education, and there's 
tremendous overlap. I talked with recently Cornelius Grove, who did a, a book on East Asian um, education. And, you know, what I would assume, and we even talked about this, like the way that I, I think about teaching and learning, I would think would not sit well in the, the common perception of East Asian education being rigid and whatever. And he said, no, actually, you, you would fit quite well. So, like, it it, uh, it to me it, it underlies the uh, importance of and the overlap there of really valuing cognitive engagement and knowledge in context, which I suppose is is part of or a big big theme that 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 you're talking about with common lit and the way you think about literacy. Yeah, yeah, no, I would be curious you know, I would listen to that podcast or I would love to help you facilitate <laughs> is, you know, would Timothy Shanahan be critical of PBL? Yeah, I and I don't know. know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, one thing that I have come to realize is that there we sometimes, I think, in education get so caught up in like the definitions mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, we kind of speak at this like 30,000 foot level and sort of debate things that are so high up. And I wonder if sometimes we could just bring it down to like, okay, Mm -hmm. well, let's actually look at an instructional unit together. Like, is this PBL? Is this personalized? Is Mm -hmm. this, you know, content rich? And like, what actually does that mean when you're talking about what students are experiencing every day in the classroom? Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and I've written a bit about it. I've talked with, I don't know if you know or are aware of Catherine Burblesing, who's uh, headmistress of Michaela School in in London, and, and she really pushes back on this sort of inquiry-based. And But again, I think we actually have lots of common ground, and the, the importance of knowledge and inclusion of that in project-based learning is something that I think is essential in doing it well and to the extent just like if you do literacy poorly that could be a, a sort of disastrous I think the same thing with project-based learning so that's a that's a whole whole, whole uh, I suppose rabbit hole we could we could go down so one question I, I'm wondering about is as teachers use and schools perhaps if you want to speak at that level use common lit what is or what are some of the ways in which you envision or have seen perhaps sort of ideally them engaging with it? And what does that look like sort of whether it's in a unit or uh, maybe it's more granular than that? I'm not sure. But what does that sort of pathway look like and and the actual work as you think this is this would be a great way or these are great ways in which we see schools and teachers engaging with Common Lit? Yeah. Um, So... We actually just, I'm glad you asked me this question because we just launched a brand new flagship product called Common Lit 360. And so this is an effort that we have been working on sort of in stealth mode for <laughs> three years. And what it, we've been piloting it, uh, Common Lit 360 in 50 schools nationally, um, getting feedback and changing it. And um, what it is, is it's a comprehensive grade level English language arts curriculum, full curriculum, completely free. Um, And we currently have it offered for grades six to 10. And so these are six instructional units for each grade um, that have a lot of these um, inquiry, uh, you know, approaches that we envision a lot of discussion, related media exploration, content-rich, um, and a lot of um, project-based learning elements, too. So, you know, it would just be so curious. It, this is j- literally, we just launched it on June 1st, um, and so it, we're so curious to see how that's going to change how teachers and schools move through Common Lit. Mm-hmm. And we anticipate that it means that Common Lit will no longer be a supplemental tool, but will actually start competing in the core curriculum space starting this next year. Hmm. And and so that looks like I'm, I'm actually on the page here. And so curriculum for grade six through ten. What 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 does that like really look like on a on a sort of day to day or or maybe even planning level in in your mind with teachers? Yeah. So um, a few things. All of the material, this is essentially the tool that I wish I had when I was a teacher in Mississippi. So kind of bringing this, you know, episode full circle, it um, has 
com- every lesson is ready made um, for teachers, but it's also editable. So, um, you know, and it's all listed out in order for teachers. We really tried to make it very lean um, in terms of the design and very easy to use. Um, another key piece was just the, um, you know, cultural responsiveness of the units themselves, um, you know, the relevant topics that are relevant for students. Uh, we really pushed hard on that throughout the design phases as well. How do you, uh, so, so I would imagine that Common Core is at least is somehow embedded in this, but, you know, Common Core and Texas is Teaks, there are other places that use perhaps different curriculum or standards or, or content guidelines how do you how did you build those different things or you know if I'm a teacher in Texas or in a state that's either common core or not common core I mean the alignment with those specific I guess skills because ELA to me is the content mm-hmm. is very much skill based there are certainly some some uh, some factual understandings you think about Shakespeare or some of the great writers or things like that but to me you know the the, the, the sort of core foundation is is skills of literacy reading writing speaking listening so how do we how, how did you match those up with with what teachers might actually be experiencing or needing to be a, or being held accountable for I, I suppose is a better way to put it mm-hmm. yeah I think that you know one sort of maybe dirty secret that people don't really know is that I think there's more in common in terms of state standards with Mm -hmm. Common Core than maybe people would like care to admit, Um, particularly when it comes to English language arts standards, Mm -hmm. like there's just so much overlap. Um, And so the debate about standards and skills and ELA is like very much on the fringes of Mm -hmm. what kids are learning. Um, So in that way, you know, Common Lit 360 is very much, um, you know, we anticipate to be nationally used and widely used, Mm -hmm. just like Common Lit is nationally used and widely adopted um, in every state. Um, You know, I mean, we have uh, teachers using Common Lit um, in about 75% of American public schools today, where we have at least one active classroom using, you know, our supplemental tool. Uh, So, uh, you know, the within Common Lit 360, you'll find common core standards that are listed out um, and some really nice crosswalks and guidelines for teachers that might be in other areas. Okay. And there, so there's a, a essentially a framework that they can engage with, and then the texts are available digitally and in print. Mm-hmm. And and what, like, just in a, in a nutshell, what's the elevator pitch for the framework that you suggest teachers engage with I guess these these yeah. uh, literacy resources, but I guess suppose any any literacy resources. Yeah. So the the elevator pitch for Common Lit three hundred and sixty is that number one, it's completely free. Um, Common Lit three hundred and sixty is actually, I think, one of the first openly licensed digital first English language arts curriculum. So it's not just like materials that are hosted on a platform that you can download. There's actually a lot of interactive components with the technology, um, which is just like a game changer, I think, for the field. And the first time I think teachers in the United States will see um, all of these digital tools and content available for free on a platform. Um, The other key piece instructionally or part of the elevator pitch is that with Common Lit 360, um, our goal is to get kids reading, writing, and speaking every day in class. And we want to increase, you know, it's back to the number of instructional minutes, increase um, the number of instructional minutes students have been actually doing those things. So they're in very discussion-rich classrooms. They're going to be reading, um, you know, really engaging stories that were handpicked by our veteran team. You're not going to find those dinky stories. Um, You're going to find discussions, um, you know, media explorations, some cross-disciplinary, kind of more hands-on optional projects for for teachers to do and embedded assessments throughout. Does it get into... So so I'm reminded of years ago when I... 
really started getting into project-based learning and looked into, I don't know, uh, folks might remember PBL Works is now, or it used to be called Buck Institute for Education. And years ago, when they first started as a nonprofit as well, they were actually giving away sort of projects that were were pre-made uh, they were they were uh, um, really interesting in their design and and so you uh, you could actually look at and, and and they sort of almost not exactly but almost scripted out like here's how this this will go and here's day two day three kind of thing and there's there's a bit of a danger there in like people just engaging in it and using it but not really thinking deeply about the way that it's that it's designed and, and architected and then saying all right I, I can design something like this on my own but for those teachers who are really thoughtful about that process with project-based learning and, and I'm wondering with commonlit 360 especially is is it is it really sort of almost scripted and day-to-day -day kinds of things? Does it get that granular or is it a little bit more big picture? And is it something that that teachers can look at, say, this is an approach, sort of a framework and process, and then I can take that framework and process and you know, design something myself, either using some of the, the common lit, uh, literacy resources and or other resources. Is it really that granular? I would say it's way more on the granular side than on the framework side. Okay. And the analogy I would give is like, it's sort of like Chipotle. <laughs> so where you go and there are options, but you're going to have a full meal. You pick your base, you pick your, you know, uh, what toppings you want on it. But, and there's choices within that, but, you know, we've sort of limited the choices in a way that, you know, where students will have a full meal at the end of all of that. Um, what we find is actually that our approach, this kind of like Chipotle customization okay. approach, um, really um, has high teacher satisfaction among novice teachers and veteran teachers too. So even the folks that, you know, are like, oh man, I really love instructional planning and tweaking. They will find lots of flexibility within the model. Okay. So the website is commonlit.org, and we'll put that in the show notes. And I'm curious, before I let you go, what are some of the things that you would recommend as, like, really important readings for folks who are interested in ELA? And also, uh, what have you read recently that has really resonated with you? And maybe those are the same things. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we just keep talking about um, – you know, the thing on my mind, and we, we touch on this, is like, how are we going to remediate and how are we going to, quote unquote, differentiate instruction within English language arts in a way when kids come back to school after this, you know, hellish year that we've all had? And how are we going to do it in a way that is like truly consistent with research? Um, because that's the only way we're going to narrow persistent achievement gaps for kids. Um, so... I'm just going to make a uh, plug one more time for the Timothy Shanahan blog. Um, get immersed in that. I have uh, I have two kids, so I can't say that I'm doing a lot of reading these days. <laughs> uh, my hands are full with a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, but those blog articles are really just the right amount of wonky um, and <laughs> are just – he's just so funny too. So <laughs> I would encourage everyone to check it out. Okay. Any other places that folks should find you outside of commonlit.org, uh, social media or other links or things you yeah. want to share? Yeah, absolutely. Please follow me on Twitter. It's Michelle at Michelle Eileen on Twitter. Um, I'm trying to become more active. Um, and, you know, uh, check out commonlit.org and also follow up at commonlit on Twitter where we'll be sharing lots of resources for commonlit 360 through our social channels in the coming months. Uh, your personal handle you said Michelle at Michelle I like that so when most people listen mm -hmm. on on Apple Podcasts or iTunes and we can't make mm -hmm. links live there so can you maybe mm -hmm. spell out or at least the the, the sure. second part? <laughs> yep Eileen is E-I-L-E-E-N at Michelle Eileen. 
Okay. And we There's will put a lot that, of ease in that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We'll put that in the show notes. So if folks are listening on iTunes or places that the links aren't live, you can go to wegrowteachers.com and find this page and it'll be in there. So Michelle, it's been a pleasure and certainly an interesting conversation. And, and maybe I'll, I'll see if I can't get Timothy on the podcast to talk a little bit more as, as I've been thinking for some time as I watch his Twitter back and forth with folks. So thanks so much. Thank you for having me. That'll do it for today's podcast episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget to review us and share us on your network so we can grow our audience to better meet your needs. Also, don't forget to find us on our websites, teachthought.com and wegrowteachers.com, as well as our various social media outlets.